information, which is um, and, and and they started thinking about this long journey, you know, this long journey that then brings us all of us coming from different places on this evening together. And oh, oh, since there is a little time, I want to tell you a little bit of um, of the story history, and I want to go back to an evening in 1996 in Jersey City, where I gathered uh, um, with a group of uh, Italian American women. Um, some writers, some scholars, and we ate bean soup, dine, and um, we were talking, and we we're talking about our desire to create our uh, existential creative angst, how difficult it was to write, uh, and how were we going to get our voices heard. And Phyllis Capello was one of the people who was there. And my daughter, Emily, who's here tonight, and the friend, uh, Sofia Capotorto, daughter of the poet, Rosa Capotorto, they were there, eight years old, and they were playing, they were playing Barbies. This was before the Barbie movie. Yeah. And so, Phyllis, <laughs> to entertain them, gave them some, you know, so something to do. And we didn't know what that was. We were just paying much attention to these girls because we had this serious, serious artistic, uh, torment to deal with while we are eating this soup. And, and at some point, these two girls came to us and started, they wanted our attention and they said, listen to the poems we just wrote. <laughs> and, and I think that that was a very significant moment. Uh, you create the space, you create the opportunity, you give the encouragement, uh, you listen to the voices of writers and they we will create. So those were the years I had finished uh, working with the feminist press on the reprint of Paper Fish. And it was really important because the feminist press became aware that there were, there were Italian American women writers. There were no Italian American women writers in bookstores, that, or at least not that, that you know, booksellers knew because when I asked, they would take me to the cooking section. <laughs> And, and so the feminist press started reprinting these books. And in addition to the reprints uh, for which I wrote afterwards and, and an introduction for, for Louise's memoir, um, they reprinted Dorothy Bryant's work and many other works, Flavia Laya's uh, memoir. Those were the years uh, where I was working on my first book, writing with an accent. And, and it took longer because I was doing all these other projects uh, um, and I don't regret because time was time well spent. When I was writing this, this my, my first uh, single author book, and it remains uh, right now my first published single author book, uh, one of the things that became clear to me that I had to include uh, when writers that nobody knew anything about. And writers who had published perhaps uh, in a tiny journal, writers were not recognized because recognition was key. And those were the years also when I was going to the events of the Italian American Writers Association. So there was a lot of, of, of work that we were doing together. That group of women uh, that met uh, um, the um, winter of 1996 ended up creating the collective of Italian American women. Kim Ragusa is, was one of the women and there was so much looking forward to being united uh, with Kim Ragusa, whom I met to edit, an editor, an editor at the Feminist Press, who told me to met, meet my friend Kim Ragusa. So this literary connection happens when things are happening. Literature doesn't happen just because you sit there and someone is gonna knock on your door. But when opportunities, we create opportunities for each other, then they multiply. And, and in 2001, with the, the collective Italian American women, we organized the first Italian American commemoration of the Triangle Fire. And I'm very proud as women, we took charge of the event because the Triangle Fire has entered Italian American memory only recently, just baby steps. I'm very honored uh, to have edited this book with Marianne Trashati, who is the president of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition has now made it possible the inauguration of this fantastic Triangle Fire Memorial, the first labor monument in New York City and one of the few dedicated to women. So as I was working on writing with an accent and I was 
I was lifting lots and lots of write-ups. Uh, it became cl clear to me that I had to do something else uh, for this literature that was really important to me, and that was uh, community projects. And that's that's what anthology does. And so I ended up editing five anthologies. And let me tell you something. If you are an editor, uh, editing sometimes is, uh, I don't want to say a thankless job because uh, um, because people thank you and recognize. But there is sometimes that this, uh, this mistaken idea that editing is a kind of mindless act of collecting. Editing is not collecting. Editing is... Uh, creating conversations uh, and, and pulling together threads and sometimes making the threads and, and getting the writers to talk and to listen to each other exactly as we're, as we're doing tonight. So thank you to the Italian American Writers Association and I'm delighted to see that its geography is, is expanding. So after I um, published uh, um, Personal Effects, uh, um, which is an anthology on the work of Luis de Salvo, um, I, I, I had decided no more anthologies. Now, now it's my turn. Yeah. Um, but there was one more that I had been calling. <laughs> and it had been calling me since I, was, uh, since I was 17. So I had to honor that 17-year-old that uh, didn't know she would leave and come to the United States and, and become an American and then have an American children and write in English. And so that was, that's what Talking to the Girls Intimate and Political Essays on the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire is. And today, tonight is, is supposed to be a conversation about memoir. Well, Talking to the Girls is not a, a scholarly book. Um, it's not a collection of articles on the Triangle Fire. They are historians who are much more qualified to do the work. Uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, Jerry brought up the American Italian Historical Association, and, and you know, I said joking, when we put the history back into it, uh, there is a particular kind of a way of doing history as writers, and that is connecting with, with the story. And so in talking to the girls, uh, what we did, we gathered a group of diverse contributors. Uh, um, there were descendants of family members, there were activists, teachers, scholars, artists. One of the two architects who designed the Triangle Fire Memorial, the Bangladeshi activist, the Kalpona actor, who says that the garment worker of Bangladesh hear the whispers of the ghosts of the workers of the Triangle Fire. So it's a very inclusive, and, and I feel good after all this anthology to end with an anthology that is not just an Italian-American anthology, because ultimately we have to talk to each other and to be in conversation with each other, but we have also gone go beyond that. So I hope you will have an opportunity to read, uh, to read the book. And whenever I have uh, done presentations uh, of this book, and this was an idea of, uh, of my dear friend, Daniel Antilotto, mm -hmm. uh, that many of you know, when we did one of the first presentations of talking to the girls, she said, let's dedicate it to, to someone related to the fire. Franco and Isa Ardito. Franco, four years old, and Isa, two years old. They were the children of Anna Ardito who died in the fire. They went back to Italy, they were taken back to Italy and their life continued there. A few months ago, I was giving a virtual talk um, at the University of, uh, at St. Andrews University in Scotland, talking about the Triangle Fire. And once we went to the Q and A, the conversation, this young woman told me she was uh, the great great granddaughter of Anna Vito. Mm -hmm. That's what the Triangle Fire history and stories is these incredible encounters. There were many, many orphans as a result of the Triangle Fire. So I would like to dedicate this evening to the orphans of the Triangle Fire and their untold stories. So in this book, uh, we wanted, as I said, to include uh, we wanted the book to be inclusive, but 
we also wanted to make sure that there was room for the Italian American voices that tell the history of the Triangle Five, because there's a, been a long uh, silence around uh, many historical events that are important to understand Italian American history. And, and Italian American historians have shed light on, 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 on many of them. I think with the Triangle Fire, we had just begun. We had just begun. Um, there are there is even a revision of the history because for the longest time, uh, um, when looking at the radical history of the early 20th century, the role of the Italian women was seen as the women who you know stayed in the kitchen. And you know, thank God we have a book uh, like Living the Revolution by Jennifer Guglielmo, who tells us uh, who tells us another story. So there is a beautiful essay by Annie Lanzilotto. And uh, I just want to tell you a few things about the essay. Annie's essay um, is not the essay by a descendant of a triangle worker. It's the essay of a triangle or a writer and triangle fire activist so, who also tells the story of what it means uh, as a writer who is economically disenfranchised uh, to pu be pushed out of her home by gentrification. And how that is another untold story. And that story then uh, intersects with the story of, of her uh, peregrinations uh, through the neighborhoods of uh, Manhattan and other parts of the city and even of Oakland, New Jersey, where the homes of the workers are. And where every year, thanks to this wonderful initiative uh, um, that was created by the filmmaker Luz Sergo called Chalk, people take an address and go there and they chalk the name. Uh, and this initiative, and I said, well, I'm in Boston, I cannot do it. Well, do it, do it in Boston. During uh, during the lockdown, uh, I couldn't take my students anymore uh, out to New York. And so now uh, the, the students started doing it in, the, in their neighborhoods in, in New Jersey. So you can do beautiful chalk projects uh, for the Triangle Fire in Boston as well. Um, and so I want to encourage you to do to do that. And um, and Annie also writes about what she calls a wounded map of Sicily. And it's a map of Sicily that she drew when she traveled to Sicily, all the towns where the Triangle workers came from. When I first learned about the Triangle fire, I didn't even know that the, the workers were died, many of the workers were died in the, in the fire were Italian. I didn't know that most of the dead were Sicilian women and girls. I didn't know that one of the Sicilian girls who died in the fire was one of the youngest 14 year old Rosaria Maltese who died in the fire with their 20 year old sister Lucia and their mother Catherine, 39 years old. And their descendants, uh, Serfin and Vince Maltese, started sometimes in the 1970s. Uh, a group called Triangle Fire Memorial Association. It was a, was a survivor's group. Who knew about that? So I think we still have to do a lot of work of recovery. And this work of recovery is not just about going into the archives and collecting historical record, records, but really beginning to tell the stories, whatever stories we, we have. And the story doesn't have to be a story that has a direct connection with, in this case, the the, the triangle fire. We always witnesses in one way or the other. Even we may be marginal peripheral witnesses, but we're always there. And, and so we have a story to tell. So as I was thinking about what to read tonight, and 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 I was gonna read from memoir, and so um those of us who write memoirs know very well that writing memoir is not so simple. It's not writing about your life. It's about writing about what you remember. And what you remember, well, sometimes is true and sometimes is not. Who knows? <laughs> there are multiple accounts uh, of the past. Uh, and, and we all know that if you get together with your family member, family members, everybody's going to have a different story. But let's face it. If we could get together with the different versions of ourselves over the years, we would all tell a different story of a particular <laughs> event. But sometimes uh, the past, uh, the memory of the past, uh, 
Harris an emotional current that is so powerful that when you try to write things as you remember them, it doesn't work. And in that case, you turn to the speculative memoir. So this is uh, from a speculative memoir that was published in recently in the Adroit Journal. And <laughs> And, and it's called The Summer of the Orphans. We roamed the woods at dawn, that wild summer with our men. It was the summer of orphans and wolves. Some of us still have baby teeth. We have been warned not to steal from the mother superior's grove. But we did, <laughs> and cracked almonds with our teeth. We washed away the green fuzz that stuck to our teeth and sucked the juice of unripe almonds. Pine nuts were harder to crack. Still, we gathered them, held them gingerly between our young molars that pressed hard, squinting. We could crack everything, everything, even a red moon night. A dozen nuns and 60 boys lived in the austere building of the orphanage, less than a five minute walk from our little house. There was no room for grown men that summer in the land where Hades has stolen Demeter's daughter. I love pomegranates. But I knew men were not to be trusted. Boys, boys were different, especially orphan boys who picked the almonds too high for us to reach and promised to show us werewolves on a full moon night. On Sundays, the playground crowded with adults from the outside world, grandparents, aunts, uncles, fathers, and mothers too poor to keep their children home. I lingered on the borders of the playground, a curious and shy spectator. A heightened emotional current saturated the air. The boys looked younger and vulnerable. They were no longer the kids with whom I played all day long during the week. I realized then the depth of their solitude and sadness. That carried, they, they, they carried, and the most of them, Serge and Dario, masked so well. I didn't know where Dario had lost one for both parents. He never spoke of his family. I don't remember anyone ever visiting him. I didn't know how long he had lived at the orphanage, but it must have been a few years. You saw it from the way he walked, how he talked to the nuns, to the other boys, like someone who was at home in that strange place. Sometimes, though, I would catch a shadow across his face. It wasn't sadness, it was something hard. Like the anger that marred my father's face when we didn't listen to him. There was a lot of crying when relatives and parents left. All the boys cried, even the teenagers. Some wondered why died and lost on the semi-deserted playground. One day, my uncle, aunt, and cousin came to visit. They brought ice cream. One of the adults instructed us not to let the orphans see us, or the boys would feel bad. Why couldn't buy ice cream for the boys too, I thought. But I didn't have the courage to ask. I remember when Luigi, a scrawny boy of 11 or 12, had shared the chocolate wafers his mother had brought him with us. I licked the ice cream slowly until it bled into the cone. I chewed the mess. The wafer stuck to the roof of my mouth. That summer, my mother was less strict than at home, except for meals, sleep, and washing at least once a day, 
She relinquished the care of us girls aged 9, 11, and 13 to that place. Our skin became tanned and tough, marked by scratches and bruises from when we ran and fell in the forest in the morning and when we played with the older boys. After lunch, we escaped nap time and sneaked out of the sleeping house. We crossed the dusty country road that ran downhill all the way to the big almond tree that had become our meeting point. We twisted the almonds, pulled hard, a seesaw with a reluctant tree. Most almonds were not yet ripe. The green shells were still soft. Some we could crush with the palm of our hands. If they started hardening though, we had to crack them with our teeth. One afternoon, our top, slow and lazy from the heat, my sister turned to Dario and flushing her most seductive smile said, Kitty was posare in the dress. My heart skipped a bit as I waited for Dario to say which one of us he wanted to marry. <laughs> I sat in the tree swinging my legs, caressing almonds, the small mound of green felt alive in my lap. Dario looked at me, lifting his chin lightly. Enica, una creatura, I said, slipping into the Sicilian tongue. Creatura, creature. That's how the adults refer to babies. Dario had reasonably narrowed his choice, stated the obvious. I had seen the admiration in his eyes when he watched my brassy sister and my blushing blonde blue-eyed cousin. Yet, all along, I had felt it belonged to me. Now I saw myself through his eyes, short hair, thick glasses, knobby knees, no hint of puberty, the graceless, shy follower of my sister and cousin. I made as if I was not paying attention. I chose to care one almond, held it between thumb and index finger, and studied it, then placed it between my molars and cracked it open. I extracted the fragments of the crushed almonds and placed them one at a time in my mouth then chewed the tender skin hard, grinding my teeth. So much beauty and sadness permeated the haunting summer when the orphan boys taught us about the creature that haunted the forest, half human, half wolf. Wolves were familiar creatures on an island where mothers and grandmothers rocked their children to sleep singing lullabies that threatened to give the children away to the black wolf lest they fall asleep. A lullaby so ancient, as ancient as our Greek ancestors. Women have always known that feral beasts lurk nearby. I knew about the Timanari. The half human, half beast creatures that terrorize people on full moon nights. It was the orphans of Piazza Medina, however, who told me about that lore that must have spoken to them with the power and veracity that I, a child with parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and neighbors who doted on me, could not understand. Werewolves were taller than regular humans and could run both standing and on all fours. No one could outrun them. You should never be out alone on a full moon night or the Lupa Manaro will snatch you and devour you piece by piece. You had to be smart and go out in a pack. We boys who knew how to elude those terrifying beasts. There were sad, unfortunate creatures too, the Lupi Manari. It was the moon that walked the dormant beast the human form returned at dawn. When they woke up, all blooded, they had only vague memories of what had transpired, like a bad dream. During the day, they were regular men, decent husbands, loving fathers. But when the moon was full, especially if it was red, beware. They could kill their own children. 
We listened to the stories of the werewolves in terrified silence. Only my sister with her usual bravado said she wouldn't believe in werewolves. Daddy smiled. Do you want to see the Lupo Mannaro? All we have to do is meet the boys near the orphanage three nights from now. They will show us. With them, we will be safe. On the night of August 8th, a big round red moon hung in the sky. I was so nervous I could not eat. I kept glancing at my sister and cousin. My cousin, incapable of lying, blushed and smiled too much. But my sister, master of all situations, chatted with my mother and aunt and distracted them. She got up and cleared the table without being reminded. My mother changed the baby for the night and we all got into our pajamas. We waited until the rhythmic sound of the sleeping bodies and the cicadas outside was all we could hear. We crawled out of bed, got dressed, and shoes in hand, climbed out of the window, my sister and left a jar. Once we were a few meters away from the cabin, we ran. The strangest animal cries accompanied us. The glow of the moon was a searchlight on the darkened road. The distance between the cabin and the orphanage seemed to have grown since we left the orphanage a few hours earlier. Wait, my sister hissed as I ran ahead. I reluctantly slowed down until she and my cousin caught up with me. A dozen boys waited a hundred feet from the bulky, haunting mass of the orphanage. Its speeches had been swallowed by the night. Our silhouettes were all, all heavy breath and suppressed laughter, smell of fear and excitement. I could hear the muffled voices of my sister and my cousin, but couldn't see them. I heard Daria's laughter. And then it all went quiet. The nocturnal creatures that had been crying too went mute as well. When the howl came, it was deep, long, pained, unearthly. We shrieked, then pressed our hands over our mouths, looking left, right, behind. The howl continued as if it had been released from a sealed well of sorrow, raw and thick and ancient. Not the sorrow of one creature, but the sorrow of all the sad men and boys of the world. Breathless, we listened as it crawled towards us. A shape emerged from the darkness, making fierce animal sounds, screaming, the, sk the kids scattered everywhere. I stood there mesmerized. I could not make the creature's contours out. It seemed clumsy as it struggled to orient itself. A hand grabbed mine. Come, the boy's voice said, run. We ran in silence, broken only by the heaviness of our breath and the thumping of feet, not just ours. Finally, my companion stopped behind the tree, a signal to me to squat. In the shadow, I recognized Dario. He brought his finger to his lips. I nodded. My knees pressed against the back. I felt the trunk with my hands. Its rough solidity was impenetrable and reassuring. My right arm extended al along its circumference. It could not reach around it. I nailed its smell. It must have been one of those ancient pines, the top of which was barely visible during the day. We had run all the way to the forest. My eyes adjusted to the darkness. The thick shapes of the trees look like giants are willing to give us refuge. My left thigh pressed against Darius. The red ball of the moon looked at us through the branches. The howl continued, lonely and desperate. They stayed at the edge of the forest. 
The other children were whispers I heard among the sounds of the night, harsh, jarring, so different from the music of the forest of dawn. There were no mothers, no aunts, no nuns. We were no children. We were small animals, wild with fear. The howl was no longer feral, just a weak cry for help. It sounded closer. The night breeze rushed between my scrawny legs. Dario turned towards me. His eyes gleamed in the dark. I couldn't see his nose, his mouth, only the shape of his head. Would he too turn into a werewolf? The cold hand of the night caressed my spine. I shivered and closed my eyes. When I opened them, his eyes had disappeared. But I heard a smell, his breath, fast, sweet. Someone called my name. Thank you. <laughs>